Hello, everyone. Welcome, uh, and let's get things started. Thank you for joining us this evening. My name is Julio Friedman. I'm here with the Center on Global Energy Policy, where I'm a senior research scholar. I'm delighted you're here tonight. We got a blockbuster panel of speakers for you tonight, and I couldn't be more excited uh, than what we're doing this evening. We're going to discuss new and emerging policies for carbon capture, uh, and I will introduce the panelists in just a moment. First, let me quickly say that this event is being webcast live with full video, and it will be available at Columbia University Center on Global Energy Policy's website. Uh, in the coming days, we archive these things, and you can get them uh, there at the website in the future, even though we are being webcast live now. For those of you who are watching online, as well as the people here, uh, you can ask questions for the panelists anytime using the hashtag CGIP events at our Twitter handle at Columbia University. Again, the Twitter handle is Columbia U, I'm sorry, Columbia U Universe, Columbia U Energy. One more time, at Columbia U Energy on Twitter and use the hashtag CGEP events. With that, I am delighted to introduce uh, the panel here. I'm gonna start actually with two panelists who we're gonna bring up in a minute. Uh, these are people, uh, one of whom I've known for a very long time, one of whom I'm only just getting to know. Uh, the one I'm just getting to know is, uh, works here at Columbia University at the Sabin Center on Climate Law. Her name is Romani Webb, and Romani is a scholar uh, working there, and among other things is uh, working specifically on the legal and policy questions and regulatory questions around CO2 storage. Um, Shannon Angelski. Uh, is somebody who I've known for a very long time. She works at Van Ness Feldman, and among other things, uh, she is the director of the Carbon Utilization Research Council, uh, which is a group that works on these topics uh, in the legislative context in Washington, D.C. Uh, the final panelist who I'm going to introduce is going to actually first give a talk this evening. Her name is uh, Judy Greenwald. I've known Judy for a very long time and had the good fortune of working with her at the Department of Energy. Uh, Judy has a long and accomplished bio. I would encourage you to look it up at the Anlinger Center uh, uh, for Energy and the Environment at Princeton University, where she is a fellow there. Among other things, uh, I worked with her in the context when she was the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Climate and Analysis, and among other things, did an enormous amount of work trying to provide quantitative understanding and policy understanding for some of the most vexing questions and challenges we were facing in the Obama administration at the time. Um, we are discussing 45Q and other policies for carbon capture, uh, and we're going to have a conversation among the panelists in a bit, but first we're going to have Judy present uh, a short presentation uh, on the vexing question of what these carbon capture tax credits are. What is the reform of the extension? Where are we at? How can you use it? Why, as it says in the headline, is this good news for the climate? Uh, please allow me to welcome Judy Greenwald. Thank you so much, Julio. It's so good to be here at Columbia University. Good evening, everyone. I'm going to talk about good news for the climate, carbon capture, tax credit reform, and extension. Here's an overview of my talk. First, what is carbon capture utilization and storage, sometimes called CCUS or carbon capture for short? Why is it important? What is the Section 45Q tax credit extension and reform? That's Section 45Q of the US tax code. Why is it important? How did the 45Q tax credit extension and reform get enacted? And what's next? I'm going to try to focus as much time as I can on how this enactment happened, because it's a really interesting story, and I'm a character in it. And, um, but I do want to make sure people realize, in case you want to know more uh, details about carbon capture, I may whet your appetite a bit on that, that Julio Friedman, who you have here on the Columbia campus is one of the world's foremost experts on carbon capture. So you should definitely take advantage of the fact that you have his expertise and good sense of humor here. Okay, so what is carbon capture utilization and storage, or CCUS? So in short, you start at the bottom left corner there with a source of carbon dioxide emissions that's coming out of a smokestack usually. It might be a factory, it might be a power plant. And then we use chemical and physical processes to capture that CO2, compress it, 
put it in a pipeline, transport it, and then inject it deep underground in geological formations that are stable and actually keep the CO2 permanently stored and keep it out of the atmosphere. Generally, we talk about saline reservoirs as good places to store CO2 perm permanently, but there are a lot of other options as well. As you might be able to see in the upper left, there's also some other interesting capture options that are just uh, being developed. One's called direct air capture. We actually can pull the CO2 directly out of the atmosphere. Just up, up until a couple of years ago, we thought that was kind of futuristic, but there's been some really in exciting innovation in that just recently. There's also in the middle, there's the net power plant, which is this really cool new natural gas power plant technology. It's a pilot project just outside Houston. I had the pleasure of visiting it a few weeks ago. And they actually think that they're going to be able to capture 100% of their CO2 emissions from a natural gas power plant at the same net and have costs of power at the same net, net cost as a conventional power plant. So this is a really potentially big deal and a potential game changer. On carbon dioxide utilization, so not only can we store CO2, we actually might be able to make things out of CO2. In our economy, we make a lot of things out of carbon. We could make a lot of those things out of captured carbon. So this is also a hot area of innovation. At the moment, the biggest arena that we have for, for uh, commercial utilization of CO2 is carbon dioxide enhanced oil recovery, or CO2 EOR. And in certain circumstances, oil companies go down into a, a, a well, they drill for oil, they bring up a bunch of oil, and there's still a lot of oil left. So what they can do is they can inject carbon dioxide deep underground, and when you do this with CO2 at the right temperature and pressure conditions, CO2 develops these really great properties, whereas it mixes with the oil and actually brings up more oil. So you can increase the oil production out of an existing well using carbon dioxide, and oil companies actually pay for CO2 to do this. There, at the moment, most of the uh, CO2 EOR that's done uses naturally occurring CO2. We actually drill for CO2 that occurs naturally underground, bring it up, and then re-inject it for enhanced oil recovery. And uh, meanwhile, we are emitting lots of CO2 all over the, the country and the world and treating it as a waste. When I first learned about this at um, oil conferences, I was just blown away that we were actually drilling for CO2. People were paying for it, and there was all this CO2 going out into the atmosphere. And I remember early on going to an oil conference where they were complaining about a shortage of CO2 supply. And I said, I cannot believe that there's a shortage of CO2 supply. Fortunately, more and more people who do this are using captured carbon dioxide, which then keeps CO2 out of the atmosphere that would have always otherwise been emitted. So this is a good thing for the environment when you use captured CO2. So this is a bigger thing than most people realize. We've got almost 50 years of commercial experience in this. U.S. is the global leader, so this is a competitiveness thing. It started in 1972 in West Texas, and it's now about 3% of U.S. domestic oil production. We actually have a network of pipelines in this country that move CO2 about 4,500 miles, and the industry is willing to pay for CO2 as a valuable commodity. It's not a waste to them in this case. So the CO2 is permanently stored underground after use, so CO2 ER is both a utilization and a storage option. You first use it to pull up more oil, and then it's permanently stored underground where the oil used to be and it's trapped. Using captured man-made CO2 significantly reduces net CO2 emissions on a life cycle basis compared to other forms of oil production. That is a good thing compared to other forms of oil production. For some people, though, that's not enough because we want to actually reduce oil consumption over time because we really need to get deep decarbonization. So in that context, if you think about a deep decarbonization scenario where we're decreasing our oil production over time, perhaps the last barrel of oil produced should be CO2 EOR because it's a relatively low carbon way to produce oil. Just like CO2 EOR is a thing, carbon capture is a thing. This is a world map of projects that are capturing and storing CO2. We have, we have 20 operating plants around the world capturing and storing about 40 million tons of CO2 each year. The green color is the operating plants, the light green is under construction, and the pinkish color is is in advanced planning. And as you can see, again, here the U.S. is a global leader. Most of the existing capture plants are in the United States. And it's not, coincident, it's not a coincidence that they're here in the United States because a lot of these early plants are able to operate economically because they sell their carbon dioxide for enhanced oil recovery. So this has been an important and not economic enabler of, um, of carbon capture. 
we have probably enough capacity to store decades worth of carbon dioxide emissions using CO2 EOR, but we have enough capacity worldwide to store centuries worth of our CO2 emissions. So globally, through saline storage, that's the big prize. So we have um, some that we can do through, through CO2 EOR for decades, but we could do this for centuries using saline storage, and that's the bigger prize that we're interested in. So the way some people think about this is we start on the left-hand side with the network that we have for uh, connecting sources and sinks and CO2 pipelines for enhanced oil recovery. And then you could envision building out this network to pick up all of the sources and sinks that are shown on the right-hand side. And you probably can't see this too clearly, but there's, there are a lot of little dots, and they're in different colors depending on the different industry. And those little dots that are so common that they look like a mass, these are the sources of CO2. So we have lots of sources of CO2 all over the country. And then those sort of turquoise areas, that's our saline storage capacity where we could store CO2. So you can imagine building out this network of CO2 pipelines, starting with the CO2 EOR network, and connect all of these sources with all of these sinks. You could also incorporate direct air capture in this network. It could either, either be part of the pipeline network or it could directly be located near saline reservoirs and you could inject right there. And you could also integrate other utilization options. You could send captured CO2 all over the place to be used in different kinds of emerging ideas where we're making things out of captured carbon. So why is CCUS important? So CCUS is a critical decarbonization technology mostly for two reasons. One is that 40% of global emissions come from the industrial sector. And we actually have a number of industrial processes that we actually have no idea how to reduce their emissions other than carbon capture. So for some key industrial sources, this is an indispensable technology. Also, we're finding that we've been too slow to get going on reducing our, our carbon dioxide emissions to get to where we need to be to protect the climate. And we actually are probably going to have to do something called negative emissions. We're going to probably have to, on net, start pulling emissions out of the atmosphere at some point. And one way to do that is through direct air capture. Also, trees do this. There's lots of other options as well. But we will likely need some form of negative emissions technology, and carbon capture is an important part of that. So when we do scenario analyses, we figure out, okay, what's it going to take to get to two degrees or more recently one and a half degrees, we find that large-scale carbon capture is required. Lots of other things are required too. We need efficiency. We need renewables. We need nuclear power. We need hydrogen. We need alternative fuels. We need electric vehicles. Lots and lots of things we need. But we definitely also need carbon capture, and it's an essential part of the portfolio. So what's the 45Q tax credit extension and expansion? So there was a pre-existing 45Q tax credit on the books. I think it was enacted in 2008. And this more recent legislation enacted five key reforms. And this was in February of 2018. It now provides financial certainty. It didn't used to. It used to be that there was a cap on the credits. So you actually couldn't be confident you were going to get the credits. So that made it very difficult to, to bank on getting the credits. Now you're guaranteed eligibility as long as you commence construction by the end of 2023. And you can claim the credits for 12 years once the project is placed in service. It increases the tax credit value. It used to be you could get $10 a ton if you wanted to permanently store CO2 in enhanced oil recovery. Now it's $35 a ton. It used to be you could get $20 a ton if you were going to store the CO2 permanently in other geological formations like saline storage. Now you can get $50 a ton. And now you can also get $35 a ton for other beneficial uses that are just emerging. It also lowers the facility eligibility facility eligibility size threshold, which is really important, lets a lot of new types of technologies play, and it provides flexibility in the use of the tax credit. A lot of times, an obstacle to using a tax credit is that you have to find an investor who has tax appetite, somebody who owns, owes enough taxes that the tax credit is valuable to them, and it's now more flexible to use the credit in that way. And it expands the eligibility of the tax credit to things like direct air capture for the first time, carbon monoxide capture, which is another emerging technology, and to other utilization options beyond CO2 EOR. So why is the 45Q extension and reform important? In short, $35 to $50 per ton of CO2 is a very big credit. 
At the project level, it's enough to close the financing gap for a lot of projects. At the policy level, it's significant in comparison to other incentives and other car carbon prices here and abroad. This is a relatively high carbon price. You may have heard about carbon cap and trade programs or carbon taxes around the world. This is a relatively high carbon price for globally. It's, it can help us scale to incre substantially increase carbon capture nationwide and ultimately globally, and it's got multiple benefits. It can reduce emissions, create jobs, displace more expensive and carbon intensive imports and other oil production, it can drive innovation in the next generation of projects, and it can support this infrastructure build out that I showed you on those earlier maps. So how did this thing get enacted? So the short story is that the FUTURE Act, and I'll explain the acronym in a moment, was included in the Congressional Federal Budget Agreement in February 2018. For those of you who follow how Congress legislates, we often have these big omnibus budget agreements that lots of things catch a ride on on their way to enactment. And that's what happened with this tax credit. It was also included with a lot of other energy, clean energy tax credits, which I will probably talk about later if I have time. The FUTURE Act, the acronym means Furthering Carbon Capture Utilization Technology Underground Storage and Reduced Emissions. This was not an acronym that I had anything to do with, but that's what the FUTURE Act is. And as you can hopefully see on the upper right corner, the lead co-sponsors were Senators Heitkamp, a Democrat from North, from North Dakota, Barrasso, a Republican from Wyoming, White House, a Democrat from Rhode Island, and Capito, a Re Republican from West Virginia. And there they are introducing the, um, the legislation. 25 senators in total, a quarter of the Senate were co-sponsors of the legislation. There was also a House companion bill. The lead sponsor was Mike Conaway, a Republican from Texas. He's, uh, his picture is over there on your right. And um, in his district is the Permian Basin, which is where most of the countries and the world's EOR activity is. There were 49 co-sponsors in the House, also bipartisan, very broad uh, base of support. And the mechanics were that the Senate in inserted the Future Act in the budget agreement. The House agreed to it because they'd already been working on it. It's a really interesting political story. It was a remarkably broad stakeholder and policymaker effort over eight years. It had multiple goals that you can see on the lower right fostering domestic energy production, supporting jobs, and reducing emissions. Not all of the stakeholders agreed on all of the goals. They prioritized different goals. They talked about different of these goals, but they all agreed that they wanted to uh, beef up 45Q. This effort overcame funding challenges. The philanthropy community wasn't that interested in carbon capture until recently. Luckily, this is getting better. It overcame opposition from the right. There were lots of people on the right who didn't want to work on anything to do with climate. And it overcame opposition from the left, many of whom wanted to focus on a much narrower set of climate solutions. The way the congressional action happened, it was bicameral, both houses, bipartisan, both parties, and bimodal. And I'll explain what I mean by bimodal. You may have heard that um, there's increasing polarization in Congress, and this is a uh, visualization of that. This is over the past 40 years. The first column is the 1973 to 74. The second is 1993 to 94. And the last one is 2011 to 2012. And if anybody, if there are any political scientists in the room who know I, where I can get updated data so I can update that last column, please let me know. I'd love to collaborate on that. The top row is um, the Senate, and the bottom row is the House. And each of these little pictures shows the political uh, ideological spectrum from left to right. And the bars are counts of members of Congress, either the House or the Senate. And you're counted blue if you're a Dem and, and red if you're a Republican. And as you can probably see, in the 70s, there was a lot of, there was a lot of uh, folks in the center, and then there was a lot of overlap between the parties. And what's happened over the past few decades is that the center has hollowed out and the parties have sorted themselves ideologically. And this is um, a phenomenon that other people have talked about. The, the problem or the challenge this creates when you're trying to legislate is that it used to be the case that oftentimes when we were legislating, we'd start from the center. You'd get a bunch of people in the center, they'd agree on what they were trying to do, and then they'd pull people from the left and the right, sometimes more from the left, more from the right, depending on what it was. But it was a center-focused initial strategy, and then you'd pull in however many people you needed to get a majority. In the sort of new world that we're in, where there isn't much of a center, 
we find that more often we can have success if we do this bimodal approach. And you're essentially, what we happened with 45Q and what some other people are doing with other legislation is we actually had people who were very conservative and, and very liberal working on this policy. They were just working on it for different reasons. So rather than trying to get everybody to agree on exactly why it was they were doing what they were doing, we got everybody to agree on what they were doing and they agreed to disagree on why. Lest you think this is just an issue inside Congress, this is a visualization of the political polarization of the American public. A little bit later, but we're still having this trend. This is from 1994 to 2017. And as you can see, we are again sorting ourselves more ideologically and, um, and where the center is hollowing out. A little bit about the 45Q uh, timeline. This is a little bit of a tease because a lot happened and I can't cover everything. I'll just hit some highlights. As a preface, in, 20, in 2009, the comprehensive Waxman market climate legislation passed the House of Representatives and then it died in the Senate. And in the aftermath of that, you know, what I would call a debacle, not everyone would obviously characterize it that way, um, we were trying to figure out what could we do that's positive? Where could we make progress that would matter for the climate and that was also politically feasible. So um, in 2010, the Great Plains Institute led by uh, Brad Crabtree and the Pew Center, I was at the Pew Center at the time, we, we figured that, that we landed on carbon capture as a place that where we could really make some progress. So we recruited stakeholders from labor, industry, environmentalists, and state officials, and we launched the National Enhanced Oil Recovery Initiative, or NIORI. We did a lot of analysis to demonstrate the benefits of this tax credit on multiple fronts, energy benefits, environmental benefits, jobs benefits, economic benefits. It was a, a co more comprehensive analysis. And we released NIORI recommendations in conjunction with um, congressional leaders. And the congressional champions evolved over the decade as depending on retirements and, um, and elections. But over time, we had a series of champions both inside and outside the Congress who worked on this steadily. And it took several Congresses. This happens a lot when you're doing legislation. It takes several con uh, Congresses to sort of socialize an idea and, and build support over time. So we had a Rockefeller bill, Rockefeller bill early on. Um, in 2015, the Obama um, administration helpfully weighed in a positive way. Julio Friedman had a lot to do with that. He's another character in this story. I was at DOE in the middle of it, and I should note that. I, so I left in 2013, and Brad and others at GPI and um, C2ES carried on. And we released a paper showing how research and development and the 45Q tax credit were synergistic in driving carbon capture innovation. And that was an important uh, argument that we made and an important insight. And we kept at this. Bills were introduced in parallel. There were some state efforts. And ultimately, in 2018, shortly before enactment, six governors actually weighed in, bipartisan group of governors, urged Congress to enact this tax credit. They were also doing some work in parallel at the state level. So that, in February 2018, enactment occurred. And interestingly, Niori became the Carbon Capture Coalition. And this was an important development that reflected what happened over the decade, which is that we st more and more realized that this was much bigger than CO2EOR. There were many, many more options for storage beyond CO2EOR, many more options for utilization. A lot of innovation was going on, direct air capture, all kinds of things. This became a much bigger deal, and the support broadened and the entrance bro interest broadened. And in parallel, we were learning more and more <laughs> about how important this is to the climate. And now the coalition has 76 members. I think when we started New York, we had about a dozen we could fit around a dining room table. In parallel, as I mentioned, there's been this state activity. There's a state carbon capture work group. It's got the 15 states that are in dark green. And there's a number of states that are in light green that are interested in participating and have some role. And I think it's both interesting and, and not that well known that we've got 15 states in the middle of the country who are working hard on a really important climate solution. A little bit about the tax extenders, just so you get some context. As 45Q was enacted, so were lots of tax extenders on lots of other types of carbon solutions. And I think a lot of times people think that different climate solutions have to compete against each other. You can only work on one and then you can't work on the other. We actually found the opposite, that each of these 
advocates who were advocating for a particular solution actually were mutually reinforcing and helped get each other over the finish line in the legislation. And we're finding a similar phenomenon in advocacy for the DOE budget. The DOE budget for energy innovation has actually been increasing over the past few years, despite that the administration keeps proposing to cut it drastically. And that's because of this same dynamic, where you have lots of different advocates for different technologies, both inside and outside of the Congress, who want more innovation across the board and their efforts are mutually reinforcing. So what's next? Projects have to start in the next four years to get the tax credit. The Carbon Capture Coalition has a federal policy blueprint, which I think Shannon will um, talk about. Oh, I forgot to mention something important about um, Shannon's organization and the history of this. So the timeline, as you saw, we were starting from a 45 cube tax credit that already existed. And that tax credit existed because a lot of people had worked on that a few years before, including Shannon's organization, which is the Carbon Utilization Research Council. There's also a lot of work going on uh, between the feds and the states on complementary federal and state policies. There's a lot of discussions going on and including carbon capture and pipelines in federal infrastructure policy, a lot of our d, &D discussion and debate and progress, and a lot of work between the, the states and the feds in this federal state interplay. What businesses have to do to get the credit, they have to innovate, they have to put projects together, they have to obtain financing, and they have to figure out how to make money. This is only going to work if it's economically viable. We have a current snag in 45Q implementation. The US Treasury Department has to issue guidance in order for people to get the credit. And usually when a tax credit is um, enacted, it just takes Treasury a couple of months to do guidance or regulations. Unfortunately, it's been two years, and we haven't gotten the guidance. And here's a little clip of Senator Whitehouse complaining about this at a hearing. Just a quick question. Just a quick question. Um, Mr. Kornbuehl, then we'll come back to you. 45Q, the carbon capture regulation. This thing passed us practically unanimously. Everybody is for it. It's been sitting over there for two bloody years. Can you please kick loose that regulation? I appreciate the concern you have. I'll do my best and certainly take it up with our team, sir. Can you explain to me why it takes two years to write that regulation? I cannot. I'm not on our tax policy team, sir. I think even if you were on your tax policy team, you could not explain why it took two years. Thank you. Um, uh, this guidance is needed as soon as possible. We're probably going to need additional legislative extension because it takes so long to get projects off the ground and especially to make up for this lost time. So lessons learned, um, and I don't know if you can see this, but the little picture says um, nothing is easy, but everything is possible. So we desperately need comprehensive national policy on climate as soon as possible, and we need to keep working on that. And we have to, but in parallel to working on that, and while we're waiting, it is possible to make incremental progress especially in conjunction with other objectives. Bimodalism can work, that the thing I showed you earlier. Politics, of course, matters. Analysis and substance matter. This was a pretty substantive effort over many years. We educated people, people learned, and found that this was important and, and, and were persuaded to do it. The state and federal interplay matters. You need, uh, mute, this can be mutually reinforcing. Relationships matter. This was a set of diverse stakeholders and policymakers who worked together o over a decade almost on this and really worked together on it, and it really mattered. The US Congress can function. And however, legislative enactment isn't enough. You have to have implementing regulations, and you have to have private sector action. And with that, I'm looking forward to our discussion. I'd be happy to take questions. Uh, thank you so much, Judy. Again, that was Judy Greenwald from the Anlinger Center uh, at Princeton University. I would like to now uh, invite up the other panelists, uh, Shannon Angelski and Romani Webb. Shannon from uh, Van Ness Feldman, uh, who is a, a principal for government issues there, and Romani Webb, who's a senior fellow at the Sabin Center for Climate Law. Um, uh, I'm going to moderate a discussion. I want uh, everyone out there to know that after about 20 or 30 minutes of moderated discussion, we will open up to questions. And again, for people who are uh, catching this by live stream, we would encourage you to send us 
notes at our Twitter handle, at Columbia U Energy. Again, at Columbia U Energy. And with the hashtag uh, CGEP events. That is C G E P events. Um, one last thing I want to say you might notice uh, uh, that one of these things is not like the other on the panel here. Uh, we are, I'm delighted uh, that uh, this is being co sponsored by the CGEP Women in Energy Program, which is a program run by uh, Julie Mourinho. And uh, uh, one of the nice things about the carbon capture uh, rubric or, or uh, an ecosystem is that we have a super abundance of incredibly knowledgeable and accomplished uh, women leaders in this space who continue to pride not, provide not only exceptional scholarship but are essential actors in this space who have made all of this progress possible. The first event that we had at Camry, the uh, Carbon Management Research Initiative, uh, was another uh, women in energy event and uh, we hope to be actually doing many more of these events not just here but also around the country uh, in part through support by the Department of Energy. With that, let me come join the panel and we'll have a discussion. Uh, thank you all again for coming here. Why don't, I'd like to start actually by uh, first asking Shannon to just make a couple of moments, minutes of statements about sort of what is the state of the state these days. Among other things, 45Q, as you heard, is uh, sort of a live beast these days and it is undergoing legislative changes right now. Would you talk just a little bit about the Carbon Utilization Research Council and where you think the legislation is at? Sure. Uh, thanks, Julio, and I'm glad that you are actually um, hosting this panel. I think I, I live and breathe this every day, so it's really nice to actually be here in New York and talking with this group to actually share some of what we do every day. So I, I'm, I'm glad that we have risen to this level, so um, <laughs> I'm glad to be here. Um, the group that I work with is, is really more of an industry voice, but we bring the entire sort of supply chain together in the development of technologies that... Um, we're looking for technologies uh, that can be part of the solution set, as uh, I think Judy mentioned, for the responsible use of our fossil fuel resources. And so we were a key uh, actor um, in partnership with the Carbon Capture Coalition, as Judy mentioned, or the then NAORI, um, in trying to get this tax credit um, both extended and expanded. Um, one thing, at least as it relates to carbon capture, that may or may not have been um, very, very obvious, but you know, one of the reasons why we were really pushing so hard to get this tax credit increased, I heard a few people doing woes out here, like, wow, that's a lot of money. Um, but it, it costs a lot to capture um, CO2 off industrial processes. Um, Julio can tell you exactly how much it costs off direct air capture facilities, but at the end of the day, um, we are looking to try to bring the cost down with this technology so it can be a competitive part of the climate solution toolbox in the same way that wind, solar, and other um, uh, electric power sector technologies are cost competitive today. I mean, it was 20 years ago that we were doing the same set of actions in Congress to get wind production tax credits, to get solar uh, tax credits, to get investment tax credits, to really increase um, the uh, innovation funding that the federal government provided for those industries, and now they're competitive. They also have state and regional policies that are um, helping to pull them into these markets. And so, you know, carbon capture is much further along, I think, than probably where wind and solar was even when they began their journey. Um, we've been doing this, as Judy said, for years. So we know how to do it, and the U.S. can capitalize on this opportunity. We just really need some upfront investment. And one of the things that 45Q did is to actually create a, a real market here in the U.S. for financial institutions to find the investment vehicles and these projects to invest in. So that's part of our job. And um, as uh, Judy pointed out, one of the things that we do and my organization does as well is we learn, we, what we try to do is set the stage to make sure that these policies that we try to design in coordination with all, all of the stakeholders that Judy mentioned, um, to make sure that we have the political support, the policy support, the stakeholder support, and we educate. And trust me, when you have a member of Congress that can come in, um, like in 2018, many of those staff that had never even heard of what carbon capture is, and they instantly went to talking about climate um, policy. So we spent a significant amount of time doing education. It's really important. So. Um, 
that is one way to set the table and get, uh, get our job done. Um, so Julio wanted me to just touch base briefly on um, some of the activities that are following through on 45Q. Um, despite the fact that we all think it's a brilliant um, program, and it is, um, you know, it, there's only, you can only make statute as perfect as the statute is. Once you actually really start digging in, doing due diligence, people are really looking at projects, and you do have those financial investors saying, well, wait a minute, this may not work. Um, this is one reason why the 45Q uh, regulation that IRS is soon to issue is really important to help us answer some of those questions. Um, but we have found that there are a few things that could be changed here and there that would be even more helpful. Um, you know, so we're looking at making some changes that may require statutory um, changes through Congress. And, and some of those are trying to make sure that you can fully monetize the tax credit. And one of the things that we didn't see coming was that tax reform was enacted five weeks before this legislation. And um, that means that um, in the Tax Reform Act, there is something in there that um, happened that is not allowing us to fully capture the full value of the tax credit. So we're looking to try to um, make changes to that. Um, and there are a few other things, like Judy mentioned, lowering thresholds, making smaller uh, industrial facilities eligible, adding more money maybe to direct air capture. The Republicans just in the House released a bill today that would do just that, believe it or not, uh, in addition to making 45Q a permanent tax credit. So these are some pretty exciting things, especially coming from Republicans on, on the climate um, conversation being part of the dialogue. Two things, and I'll end with this, because there are a variety of bills that have been introduced on carbon capture that I'm more than happy to discuss. Um, but probably it, really important is carbon capture and technology innovation is probably the one space on climate right now where there is a middle ground, there is bipartisan agreement, and there are actually people going and talking to each other. They are coming across the aisle, and they are really putting their heads together to try to move actual legislation this year. It's very possible that we will see some energy innovation legislation. Um, a lot of other bills have been introduced that you may be aware of uh, that would... Um, provide for clean electricity or clean energy standards, and there's a full, uh, a whole suite of other types of programs involved in some of these bills that are in, intended to um, address climate and, and mitigate against climate change. So, but I do think that where we can see some action, because Congress does get work done, as Judy said, um, is on those technology innovation um, programs. So, I'll end there. Thank you, Shannon. Before I turn to you, Romani, uh, we did get uh, a hashtag. Uh, Twitter message in that says, the live stream volume is too low and there's a squeaking noise. So I just wanted to pass that on to the sound people to see if there's something that they can do about that. I don't know. Uh, I leave, uh, we are in your hands. Um, uh, in addition to these kinds of financial policies or legislative actions, there's a whole set of other legal questions. And uh, I wanted to sort of ask Romani about these uh, in part in the context of climate law, but also in terms of specific regulations associated with CO2 injection or long-term site care or any of these other issues, if you'd like to speak about any of that. Sure. Um, you know, I think it's important, and perhaps this reflects my background. I'm a lawyer by training, but, you know, the, the policies are great and, and can play a very valuable role, but they're only really effective in encouraging the types of projects that we're talking about is the supporting legal and regulatory framework is clear and consistent and actually enables these projects to get built. Um, so, you know, the nitty gritty of the permitting regimes and, and so forth is really important. Um, we do, I think, as was said, have a lot of experience with um, carbon sequestration in the EOR context, um, but the rules are slightly different for pure sequestration projects separate from oil production. Um, and, and there's a lot of, still a lot of um, uncertainty around, kind of, uh, to some degree uncertainty around how those projects get permitted. Um, one of the big issues which um, Julio alluded to is around liability for storage. Um, and the, the issue is really um, the potential for carbon dioxide after it's injected to migrate through the subsurface um, and cause some sort of damage, like contaminating groundwater. Uh, for which the, in, the operator is then liable. Um, and because in a lot of these projects, uh, the carbon dioxide, after it's injected, stays mobile for um, decades, sometimes centuries, uh, that liability can, can uh, last for a long time and, and can be a factor affecting projects. Um, you know, there's been some attempts to address that issue at the state level, but really um, <coughs> not fully uh, 
not completely satisfactory. We certainly don't have any um, federal action on that um, issue. So I think that that's uh, one area that we do certainly need to see legal regulatory <coughs> change. Um, and, and absent that sort of change, um, you know, I think there is a role for project d design in, in potentially mitigating some of those liability issues. Uh, thank you very much. Um, one of the things that I like to tell students is that there's no wrong way to lose weight and there's work for everybody. Um, a lot of people have the mistaken understanding that you have to be a wizard or some engineer or something to get into this business. Uh, uh, I look across the table here and say rather differently. Um, there are in fact jobs for policy experts, for lawyers, for uh, people who are interested in international affairs. There's an enormous range of work to be done in this sector. And in that context, I'm going to uh, ask you just a few questions. Um, uh, and um, this is for uh, the entire panel, but I want to go back to something that Judy pointed out at the very beginning, which is that this is not happening in a vacuum. This is happening in a context of a dynamic energy system. In some cases, plants are sh shutting down. In some cases, new systems are opening up. Uh, we are seeing perhaps a reduction in demand for one type of fuel, say petroleum coke, while at the same time we're seeing a demand for an enormous amount of new fuel, say hydrogen, which could be made from petroleum coke. And I wanted to see if you would just talk from your own perspectives in this context, you know, about heavy industry, renewable energy, hydrogen, all these sort of things, what, how you see carbon capture as a component of this mix uh, from, all, from your perspective. Yep, Judy, why don't we start with you? Or Shannon, why don't we start with you? <laughs> so, a, as someone that mainly looks at this from the electric power sector, that's where I'm going to come from, if that's OK. Um, we are still challenged, I think, today with um, the intermittency of some of these clean energy resources on the one hand. So there are, um, and that would be energy storage. And I, when I say challenge, I mean we have some solutions, but not at scale or at prices that um, you're all willing to pay for. <laughs> Let's put it that way. Um, so, you know, I think that the role of carbon capture, at least in the power sector early on, is going to help with the outgrowth of what we see as renewables and the, and the intermittency of those resources on a grid in order to maintain grid stability as well. That's really, really important. Um, and so that's sort of the early phase, I think, longer term. Um, you know, we're going to need, in addition to renewables and um, other resources, we're still going to need carbon, you know, we're still going to be using carbon fuels. So whether we're making them to produce hydrogen as well as electricity or other things, but carbon capture is over the long term something that we are going to need to invest in and make sure that we have as part of this diverse electricity grid. The decades of infrastructure and the trillions of dollars that we have invested in our current infrastructure is something that we also have to think about. And so when you think about it from that perspective, carbon capture is also part of that solution without investing in you know, trillions more of, of that infrastructure. We have so much of it existing here in this country. Um, and I think that that's also um, part of this, you know, if you're looking at other energy sectors, we can bring all that together to bear because I think CCS really does have an opportunity even when you're trying to combine into a hydrogen economy. So I think that there's a number of ways that we could look at this that pieces of the puzzle might get integrated, but that's at least the role I see for CCS. Yeah, I very much agree. I think um, you said it best when you said it's a complement to um, all the other things that we're doing on deep decarbonization. But, um, I guess I would point out the role for um, processes developed through CCS research um, in this negative emissions world that Judy touched on. Um, you know, if we all the, the studies and the modelling show that if we want to limit warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius, um, which is one of the goals in the Paris Agreement, we need to get to net zero by um, 2050. Uh, we're not anywhere near on track to achieve that. Um, you know, even if all of the commitments made under the Paris Agreement are met, we're looking at temperature increases of three to four degrees Celsius. Um, so, you know, in that context, we are likely to end up in a situation where we do, as Judy said, need to be removing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere using these things like direct air capture and other facilities. And um, then the question becomes what you do with that carbon dioxide. And um, 
all the, the learnings from um, EOR projects and other sequestration projects that we do now can really be brought to bear in, in um, dealing with that carbon dioxide that ultimately needs to be removed from the atmosphere. Uh, before going to you, Judy, I just want to mention briefly on something that Romani uh, just described. Recently, there was a large study that was done uh, for the state of California. Uh, Lawrence Livermore National Lab uh, ran that study or led it. Uh, it was published just two weeks ago. Um, they were looking at the net negative part of net zero. They said the state's going to go to net zero. That requires 125 million tons of CO2 removal. How can we actually do that? 80% of that volume was involving carbon capture and storage, either bioenergy with CCS or uh, direct air capture with CCS. Um, and the reason why is because they could not get more than 20% with the natural solutions in the state. Uh, so uh, this is, again, for negative emissions, this ends up being an important technology. I, I hope I didn't steal your thunder, Judy. I'm still no, keen no. to get your perspective. No, I was just going to, uh, th there's so many ways that you can use carbon capture. I'll just add about um, our need for very low or zero carbon fuels and the role that carbon capture can play in that. So as most of you know, fossil fuels are hydrocarbons, and you can use carbon capture to take out the carbon part and have hydrogen fuel. So you can make hydrogen using carbon capture. You can also make hydrogen from electricity. So you could have electricity that uses carbon capture and you can make the hydrogen that way. You can also use carbon capture with biofuels. And this is kind of an interesting thing that's happening under the California low carbon fuel standard. The story will have an ending that will make sense. They, um, they allow you credit and you can have a low carbon fuel if you have a biofuel and when you make that biofuel, if you capture the carbon dioxide from that process and, and sequester it and store it. So we actually have a number of ethanol production facilities which are either already or planning to capture the CO2 when they make their ethanol and then there's a biofuel that they sell into a fuel market is very low emitting on a life cycle basis. So there's all these interesting ways where carbon capture can help us get to a near zero or zero, zero carbon economy. Uh, so a, a leading question here in that, we've been talking about 45Q where the value is about $50. This is a session on finance and policy. Would somebody talk about the value of the current low carbon fuel standard in California and what's it priced at? So, so um, it's not, it's not described this way for reasons that might become obvious, but it actually, the value of a low carbon fuel credit, in, if you were to denominate it in carbon, it's like $200 a ton. So if you actually can do carbon capture and sell into that market, it's a very, very big credit. Right, and it's important to know that that's a separate and stackable credit in addition to 45 QSU, and the right project can get the value for both of those. Um, I want to touch back on something that you kind of alluded to, uh, Judy, and I want to sort of get the panels sort of thinking about this. Um, uh, the value of 45 cube between 35 and 50 dollars a ton, uh, bizarrely, uh, this Congress and this president basically enacted a social cost of carbon. They said, we will pay 50 bucks to not emit CO2, that's what it's worth. Uh, how do you, what is your sort of perspective on that in terms of either intent or what signaling that provides to within the United States, two states, or to the rest of the world? Um, so maybe on the political side, <laughs> um, as, as Judy pointed out at the onset, I mean, this tax credit had many different, it was, it's bimodal, right? So I, I won't go over that. And, and I think that this president did not recognize that. Um, so notwithstanding that, um, you know, I think that the world is watching. I think that they're trying, I mean, my perspective is we need to get this right. Um, we need to get projects launched using the tax credit and show that it's an actual program that's functional, can work, and we can make it work. And we need to show how we are not only, you know, this is considered taxpayer dollars, of course, with these tax credits, but it's going to be a reinvestment into our U.S. economy, um, at least from that perspective, and, and how we can show benefit of that in addition to the benefit to the climate um, debate. And, and so if we can quantify that, even better. And that's what I would hope to see come out of this. But I'm not sure if that's what the question was exactly the, the answer you wanted. But uh, I'm interested in your opinions. <laughs> uh, I thought that was a lovely answer. Others have a stake in this? Yeah, I think it's a, an interesting question. Um, you know, 
And it's interesting to think about uh, the fact that whilst this credit, which effectively, as you say, creates a price on carbon, was being enacted, uh, the Trump administration was simultaneously, for example, withdrawing the official social cost of carbon, um, which was much higher. Uh, they were also you know, withdrawing a number of other policies that could have led to sort of market-based pricing solutions to, to carbon emissions like the Clean Power Plan. Um, you know, I don't know whether that uh, disconnect reflects um, the, what do you call it, the bilateral nature of carbon capture or whether it just reflects a kind of uh, lack of awareness um, within our political world. But, uh, you know, I think it's, a, it's an interesting outcome. I think that tax credits are definitely way more popular than taxes. So I, so I think that the fact that it is a price I think is very significant and it shows what the effect of that price might be and how it can help make things economic that would otherwise not be economic. But I do think the lift is easier, particularly in this country at this time, to get a tax credit as opposed to a, um, a tax, which would also provide an incentive, but it would be a, a incentive from the opposite direction. I do think, though, um, the framing of the issue that this, this CO2 is a commodity and not a waste mm -hmm. is actually super helpful to a lot of people who are trying to get their arms around this issue um, who may not want to buy the whole policy, climate policy story, but they can buy the idea that this is something useful, worth paying for, worth, worth the society paying paying to make it happen, and that's kind of the, I think that that may be the basis for success, that we can think about things that have economic benefits as well as environmental benefits. I, I want to sort of follow that thread just a little bit more. Um, uh, there are real lessons in this uh, legislative action on sort of coalition building, on developing and delivering policy, and in particular, I think, the role of legislative champions in terms of getting this stuff through the House and Senate. Uh, and again, I was hoping that you might uh, sort of think, uh, talk just a bit more about it in that context in terms of the process of coalition building and getting legislation enacted. You talked about that quite a lot, Judy, already, but I wanted to sort of follow that thread and see if there's more things to discuss. You want me to go? Um, so, well, I know, I'll go first. Um, so, from the experience, at least on 45Q, we've already talked, uh, maybe I could just use that as the, a case study. Um, Senator Whitehouse was there because he viewed it as a price on carbon, um, but there were three other members of that four um, person team in the US Senate that were there um, because they wanted to preserve the resources in their states. Uh, they wanted to make, when I say preserve, they wanted to make sure that there is a future for those resources. Um, that would include the uh, Democrat from North Dakota in addition to the two Republicans, one from Wyoming and the other from West Virginia. So that was an interesting dynamic, okay, because you have three out of the four that are kind of in it for, for very different reasons, but they still all came together. So it made it a very fragile coalition, which is why I think this broader coalition of stakeholders was really important. I can tell you um, that one of the first meetings that we had, um, and I think it was with another m member from, a senator from Wyoming, Senator Enzi's office, um, one of the first meetings we had on this tax credit program, um, there were ENGOs, I believe, including NRDC and coal companies all in the same room, and the, the staff said, this is the first time I've ever had a meeting like this, um, and it's true. Um, but they're very powerful, and to bring all of those constituencies, I call it the two bookends, um, and then we had everybody in between, and leaving that meeting, the comment that the staff said to me was, this is gonna make it a lot easier for my boss to do something. So the coalition building is extraordinarily important. It takes, it's boots on the ground, it takes a ton of time. I know that people are, um, have this, perception about lobbying in D.C. as being a terrible thing. We're advocates. We also educate. We do things that are important for all of our objectives. And so this is the kind of work that we're doing, but it's really important to bring all of those constituencies together. Um, so that also was aided by the fact that we 
provided what I'll call a sort of comfortable place for these people to talk about something. I mean, it's to find consensus on this isn't easy, and, and part of that stakeholder or, or the coalition building is there's a trust factor involved in it. Um, you need to have a, a, the, the right messenger delivering the right message even as you're building those coalitions, I think, and so, um, and that's where those relationships really are going to be very important. So, it, um, it, you know, I never thought that in my professional career those types of relationships and that aspect of our work would be something that would be so truly important, but it is. So, um, as well as all of the other academic and other type of work that we bring along with it. But yeah, a quick color commentary on that. When it was enacted, I got a lot of comments from people saying, where did this come from? This came out of nowhere. Holy cow. And I was like, no, this was like eight years, the hard boring of boards, like years and years of, of slogging and coalition building and finding legislative champions to make it happen. And I think that was part of the key takeaways is that you just, you actually need to do that work if you want to pass uh, an important law. Um, along those lines, I want to uh, pivot just a little bit, and uh, this is the last question before we go to the audience. We are interested in having you take part, and again, we have microphones that uh, will uh, help uh, allow the uh, web uh, viewers to hear your comments. But before that, um, there is an interesting sort of follow cycle to 45Q, not just in the Congress, but again in the states where we're seeing different state laws coming into being, like the low carbon fuel standard, that have direct ties back to 45Q or are, are other enabling legislation for carbon capture. And I was wondering if you guys would talk about sort of the state of that and where we see some interesting developments. You want to talk to you? I'll just say a couple of things. I'm sure Shannon has more. So um, one interesting thing that's happening now is that a number of states want to take on the um, job of permitting the storage facilities because there's a couple of concerns. One is that the EPA is kind of understaffed for a lot of reasons at the federal EPA. So a lot of states want to get what's called primacy. They want, they want it to be delegated the authority that they could actually do the permitting. And so there is an initiative now to make it easier for states to do that. And so I think that a number of states are kind of taking ownership of that and figuring out how to do that. Also, a number of states are enacting their own incentives that are complementary to the federal incentives to, to make things happen. And they're also um, working hard on figuring out how they could work together to build out the infrastructure. Because when, infra when infrastructure like CO2 pipelines crosses state lines, it can get really complicated. And so they're working together on those things. Mm -hmm. The only thing I would add to that is that um, because of the incentive and the need for infrastructure, there's a lot of what we're calling CCS hubs um, sort of emerging at the state level and regional level where you have a lot of industrial sources of CO2, current infrastructure through pipelines that already exist, and then also the geology to store the CO2. So um, we're seeing a lot more activity in those regions and at the state level and, and, and a lot of those states working together to create those incentives um, to get those hubs launched. So it's, it's actually pretty exciting. I would just add that I think, uh, you know, this is something that we have seen um, really across the, the chasm of climate, um, climate change policy. You know, there's sta many states stepping up to work on various aspects of the climate issue as um, to some degree, the federal government steps back. Uh, actually, Romani, I was hoping you might talk a little bit more about things like the uh, zero carbon power uh, standards that are coming in, the clean energy standards in many states, and how CCS could be a component of that. Yeah, um, you know, many states have, have for many years had uh, what are called renewable portfolio standards requiring um, a certain amount of the state's electricity to come from renewable sources. Um, there's a push in many places to adopt a similar policy that's a little broader, looking at, um, you know, zero or low carbon energy more generally. Here in New York, we have a, a standard that includes nuclear as well as renewables. Many places are looking at um, just a generic zero emission standard, which would um, enable continued use of fossil fuels potentially with um, CCS, which is an interesting uh, development. Right, and my color commentary on that is like that bimodal thing, it widens the aperture. And so you can have higher ambition 
they had a lot of states have gone from like 40% renewable standards to 100% zero power standards because you can have that higher ambition if you let more people to the table. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that's uh, how New York plans to get to 100% um, zero carbon energy by relying on nuclear. We couldn't get there within the time frame um, plan without relying on those other sources. So just another example of how these technologies are really mm -hmm. complements. Um, as, as much as I love asking questions of this outstanding panel, uh, I'd like to offer you the same opportunity Again, we have a mic in the back, which we're happy to bring to people who have questions. Why don't we start here in the back? And uh, if other people have questions, we'll start a queue. I've got you, sir, and you, sir. And again, uh, we are also collecting uh, <coughs> online as well. Please send something to uh, hashtag CJEP events. Yes, sir. Uh, thanks. This has been very interesting. Uh, while we are waiting for the, uh, the, the Treasury regs, have any carbon credits been claimed uh, in simple forms of transactions based on the statute alone, or has nothing happened until the regs are out? I'm not aware of any credits that have been claimed. There have been credits, so um, Judy mentioned that there was a, 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 a prior program which is still in existence, and um, that program was capped um, at 75 million tons of credits, so um, those credits can still be claimed. I mean, this program works like you just, you, you fill out a tax form at the end of the year. If you can, if you can fill it out and, and, and show that you're meeting all the requirements, then you, that's how it works. Um, so for the first year that you would have been able to do it would have been 2018. And I have not, IRS usually issues a notice about how many credits have been claimed and we have not seen anything. So I can't imagine they have. Thank you. Uh, the only other thing I'd add to that is in order for the credits to be claimed, you actually have to have a facility in operation. And before people will invest in that, they're still waiting for the IRS clarification. Uh, what is the case is that there have been a slate of projects announced that intend to use those credits. But until they begin construction they and, and operation, they're not able to claim them. Uh, we had a question here uh, for in the back. Yes, there is you it? are. Yeah. Hi, thank you. Um, I, I was wondering if uh, any of you, given your uh, closeness to Washington at all, have any sense of what kind of holdup is at Treasury or IRS? And then secondly, you know, if all this legislation simply just runs into executive or agency level blocks or incompetence, uh, what, what, do, what do the uh, elections later this year, may, uh, how can those affect uh, prospects? Are, so I actually don't know wh why it's delayed. As you saw, um, I'm in the same boat as Senator Whitehouse. I can't figure out why it's taking them so long. Um, it could be that, as um, Shannon mentioned, you know, there was a big tax reform package that happened at the same time. You know, maybe they don't have the bandwidth. Um, it also could be that they're not sure how to do the regulation. They may they're getting. It could be that there's competing commentary that they don't know how to resolve. Uh, we're not really sure. I mean, the Carbon Capture Coalition submitted comments to um, Treasury saying what they thought the regulation should look like, and that represented a very broad um, stakeholder consensus on what it should look like, so it should have made their job easy. So we're really just not sure why it's not being kicked out. I mean, do you have any insight? I mean, all I would say is that to qualify for the tax credit or to um, be in um, to, to be able to claim the tax credit, you have to demonstrate secure geologic storage. That is one of the uh, requirements. And there's a lot of questions around how best to define that, and especially for both enhanced oil recovery and then also for non-EOR applications on the one hand. Um, CO2 utilization is something that I think they're going to defer um, because they simply, they, they don't have the expertise. So I, that could be part of this um, and um, as well as many of the other reasons that I think Judy are already pointed out. So Yeah, on that, um, you know, there is a specific provision of the legislation that requires IRS to work with EPA and DOE and I think the Department of the Interior in developing the regulations. Um, you know, this is well outside their area of expertise to decide what's permanent um, geologic storage. 
So, um, you know, I, I can imagine that those interagency collaborations are perhaps not um, going hugely smoothly given the staffing shortages at many of those agencies. Uh, there's, I think there's a contributing factor as well that's not sufficient to explain it, but in the middle of all this there was a government shutdown, <laughs> and that put the IRS back a bit. Uh, and they, I, I think they received a million emails in the month that they were shut down because it was close to tax time and so that they had other work to do. So first you, sir, in the back, and then we're going to go to you, and then to you, and then to you. Yeah, my question goes back from the policy side to the operational side. And it's a very naive question, or perhaps I should say a very naive questioner, because I'm not even sure how to phrase it, but it has to do with physical volume. Uh, can you say anything that would be intuitively meaningful about how many cubic meters are a ton of carbon and what are the total amount of space that it might take up and is there some limits attached to that? Yeah, that's for me. Um, uh, I am not a geologist, but I've spent 20 years working on this problem. So the conservative estimate for storage capacity in the United States is two and a half trillion tons of storage. Uh, we are not limited by geology. The median average is five and a half trillion tons and the high end is 20 trillion tons. For comparison, all of humanity's emissions for all of time has been two trillion tons. So uh, just America could do the entire globe's total emissions you know, by volume. Geographically, there are places where there is not really storage. So Minnesota is a place where there's not really storage. Other states, California and Texas, interestingly, uh, opposite ends of the political spectrum, both of them very much planning to rely on that as an important natural resource. Um, thank you. Let's uh, over here. There's also on that. There's also lots of storage capacity offshore in the subsea bed, which is a really promising area of study that we're doing a lot of work on here at Columbia. Thank you for saying that. Actually, for so first of all, Romani's already written a paper on the offshore bit, and I encourage you to take a look at it. Also, offshore has the advantage that it's not under people's houses, which, and and the landowners are often like the state, so, or nobody, which makes some of this a little transactionally easier. Thank you. Um, my name is Guinea Vik. I'm from the Norwegian consulate. So we are a tiny country, but we have some of the same challenges and opportunities that you have. And I wanted to ask you a question about the cost of carbon capture and storage, and if you've seen a decline in the cost, and if you also see a future decline in the cost um, disregarding tax credits. Thank you. So I'm happy to defer that to other people, but I'm also happy to answer it. Um, what are your guys? Yeah, this is, again, I'm a I'm functional expert on this. Before I answer, though, thank you, Norway. Yes. <laughs> thank you, Norway. Norway has been the global leader in this technology, and they did the first project in the world in 1996 and continues to champion these things, including a new project capturing from industrial sources, including a cement plant and a waste incinerator plant in Norway. And they're uh, pioneering an idea of capturing the CO2 and transporting it by ships to far offshore sites. So there's a lot of very interesting stuff that's going on there. The question was one about costs. Uh, today, you can get a price guarantee, full system, capture transportation storage for $100 a ton. Uh, when you're getting paid $50 a ton, it's hard to make money doing that. But that's basically from any source from a pre-existing pure source like the ethanol plants that uh, Judy was talking about, the all-in costs are about $20 a ton, which makes us more actionable. On the technology cost decline part, there is incredible progress on that front. And there's a number of companies that are now pledging basically less than $30 a ton full system carbon capture. The plant that Judy pointed to, the net power plant, basically says that they can do it for zero cost, that the that they can sell zero carbon electricity from a natural gas plant at 1.9 cents per kilowatt hour, which is extremely competitive. We'll see, the plant's not operating yet, but these kinds of things are coming forward and in no small part because of Shannon. Shannon's tireless efforts to actually s sustain innovation as a policy in the United States have helped make these advances possible. Mm -hmm. Can I gush about Please. NetPower for a yeah. minute? So, so I just went to see NetPower a few weeks ago, and I had been talking about this plant for a couple of years now, but I hadn't actually seen it, but I happened to be in Houston a few weeks ago, so I got to see it. So this is so cool. They, um, they use what's called oxygen combustion. So instead of burning the gas 
in air where you get a lot of nitrogen. Most air is nitrogen, and so you get nitrogen oxides. They do, um, they burn it in pure oxygen. And so they have no NOx emissions. So they don't even need an air quality permit. So it's, it's amazing in all these interesting ways. And they're actually using the, uh, the CO2 as part of, the, of their power generation process. It's actually part of the, the working fluid or the way they're actually generating the energy. So that capturing the CO2 is inherently part of the process. So it's not something that you add on later. And generally, in power production, the problem is that the CO2 that's coming out the stacks tends to be very diffuse. There's just not a lot of CO2 compared to the other stuff that's coming out. So they get this really concentrated stream of CO2. And so that's why they think they can do it really cheaply. But it, it's still a pilot, so we don't know yet. But if, if this works out, it's a complete game changer because you could get a natural gas power plant that doesn't have any emissions at a reasonable cost. At one correction, it actually emits fresh water. Mm -hmm. There's a byproduct stream right. of fresh water yeah. that's a consequence of this. But they don't need an air quality permit. They don't need an air quality Anything else, <laughs> Shannon, on that? No, all I would say is that with more carbon capture deployments, I mean, it's the learning curve and the cost reductions come down. Um, so, and, and we're going to see that, and we are. Before I go to our next two people, I wanted to take a Twitter question which we received. Uh, the question is, beyond 45Q, what is the next most effective federal lever to help scale implementation of CCUS? I'm going to sort of, any of you guys can answer it, but uh, I wanted to open it up. Legal reform. There's a whole lot of laws that currently uh, prohibit certain CCS projects in certain areas. And so um, amending those, in most cases, it's a really simple mix. I'm thinking in particular about offshore CCS projects, which are um, currently prohibited except in really narrow circumstances. Um, in particular, you can only um, sequester offshore carbon dioxide that's been captured at a coal-fired power plant. Um, and even in that situation, it's very unclear whether you can sequester that. Um, so a couple of legislative amendments, it's a section, um, a section in two acts would make a huge difference. I would say that I think 45Q is actually a really good model policy. It's making some changes to it that actually would be <laughs> probably the best thing that you could do. You could extend it. You could make the, right now, Judy mentioned there's a 12-year tax credit claiming period if you made that longer. Removed the commenced construction deadline, which we've already heard is, is kind of challenging to meet with these large capital intensive projects. I think if you made tweaks to that program, ultimately, maybe increase the cost for DAC, um, and then also, uh, you know, m maybe increase the cost of the credit in some other applications or had a declining um, in, in over time. Uh, it's just a perfect, I, I feel like, incentive tool right now. But there are many, you could always build on these incentives. I mean, we saw inve there investment tax credits that could help you with your upfront capital, de-risk it that way. I mean, there are a number of different things you could, um, you could do, give direct grants the same way that Wind and Solar got back in the Recovery Act. Um, to help get those launched in addition to the other financial tools and clean energy standards. Um, make them open to everything, the zero carbon standards. Uh, as a preview of coming attractions to that, right. um, our program is doing a policy design scoping exercise right now on what it takes to finance these plants and what the amendment to 45Q would look like in terms of price, in terms of moving private capital off the sidelines and into this space. We expect to publish that uh, sometime in the next month or two, uh, and uh, myself and uh, my colleague Emeka Ochu are writing that up in real time. Uh, I hope you check back with us in a little bit. Uh, uh, do you have anything to add to that, Judy, before going to the next question? Good. Okay, so uh, this gentleman here, Blazer. See you and see you too, sir. First of all, thanks for all your comments. It's, it's really fascinating and very uh, insightful. Um, two quick questions. First, for Judy, you mentioned that the, the 45Q uh, tax credit sits with the equipment uh, owner. And I wondered if you could expand a little bit on how that's different from uh, the wind and, and solar tax credits and where they sit. Um, and second question was, do planting trees count as carbon capture for 45Q? I can answer the second one. No. Yeah, the, the second one's easier. No, it's technological carbon capture. Yeah. You're correct to note that trees capture carbon. So right. it, it is, 
you know, usually when we're you know, geeky about this, we talk about technological carbon capture versus natural systems car capturing carbon, but we probably need both. In fact, we're sure that we need both. So I'm actually not sure how, how much more flexible the PTC is for wind in terms of the ownership. I think it is more transferable. I think you have more They're trying to get it more transferable. They have the same issue. So I think it's the, the same problem that you have to get somebody with tax appetite in order to right. take the credit. Right. Uh, at, at least on 45Q, what you could do, you, I think you mentioned this. You, so both answer your questions. You have to have an industrial source of CO2 to qualify for the credit. So that's, you know, so that's number one. In, in many instances, you might put a piece of equipment on the back end of it as, as one example, or you might have this net power type of a facility. Um, in either case, you have an industrial facility that is in some way capturing CO2. So that's your first uh, action, and that's where the tax credit first enters the project. It's either in that equipment that is off to the side of an existing or a new industrial source, or it's that industrial source that's also capturing the CO2. You can transfer that tax credit to the entity that is storing the CO2. Um, and so that's your only current way to get more monetization or investment into a project if you have more tax liability downstream. No. Nope. It's under, some people are suggesting, they're, they're calling it enhanced transferability. Um, it's, it's unclear whether that would, you know, how, how much more people with tax appetite or that are going to go out into the market and sell tax credits are really interested in doing that, that are part of a project. Um, but it's somewhat politically challenging to do that um, for historical tax reasons um, and abuse in other tax markets for other tax credit programs. So that's why it's a little bit challenging politically, but um, from an investment perspective, I mean, it, it, yeah, I mean, if you can have more people with investment appetite coming in, or tax appetite coming into the project, the better. Two, two quick thoughts on that and then on trees. Quick thought on that, number one, um, the big tax bill that was passed in 2017 actually reduced a lot of people's tax appetite, which has made it harder for people yep. to find this, not just for this, but for renewable tax credits yep. as well. Second is a lot of the uh, wind and solar tax credits are sunsetting and a lot of the finance houses in New York and other places are going, well, wait a second, we have staff who does this. What else can they do? And they're calling Shannon and saying, well, wait a second, is there something that we can do in terms of these tax equity exchanges or lease agreements or mm -hmm. other things? With respect to trees, I could give you the like massive long discussion component of that. I'll do the opposite. In the language that was enacted, it says photosynthetic pathways are not allowed. There's an exception of that for algae that is used for utilization. Otherwise, photosynthetic pathways are excluded from the bill. Yep. Um, you're next, sir. So um, I've looked into this topic a bit. So um, the reading that I've done suggests that for when you do EOR, for um, every ton of CO2 that goes in, somewhere between 1.5 and 1.8 tons of CO2 comes out. Um, so that's why there's still big net emissions, and it's only, I think, about 37% on balance, less emittive uh, than a conventional barrel of oil. So then that occurs to me, that what's your point about the subsidy? So I think that within the subsidy, or, or the credit of $35, is not just or the social cost of carbon, but a large innovation subsidy. Uh, otherwise, I don't see how EOR would qualify at all because it has a, very, a big negative value since more comes out than goes in. And so I wonder um, about the spread, the spread of $35 to only $50 for saline storage. It occurs to me that that spread should be much, much wider. And I was wondering if you guys could, could talk about that. more comes out than goes in. I'm, it's all about compared to what. So compared to other ways of making oil, it's definitely, we definitely have less CO2 emissions on a life cycle basis. Any oil that you produce, you're going to combust and use. Okay. 
Right, but right. I would argue that's the wrong comparison because you, you have, any oil is going to do that. So it's, it's less than any other way of making oil. So it's, it's really, if you think that you're trying to, if you think that we're going to keep making oil for a little while, then this is a way better way to make mm -hmm. oil. But if you're trying to maximize how many tons you keep out of the atmosphere, then you would go with saline storage. But if you're trying to figure out how can I make the, the oil lower carbon, then the CO2ER is quite helpful. So first Shannon, then I'll say something, and then we'll move on. But I want to address your point specifically, because I know something about that. Go ahead. Okay. Um, I'm going to talk about the policy intent. The policy intent, uh, I'm recognizing what you're saying, was to actually incentivize and encourage carbon capture, not EOR. Um, so let's, it was in the EOR tax credit, in, in the early stages of deployment of CCS, because you do get some value of the CO2 for um, the EOR projects, somebody's paying for that CO2. That's the differential that is reflected in the 35 to the 50. Um, and, and that's the only reason for that differential. Um, but so if you think about policy intent that we're starting, well, what the intent of this tax policy is to actually drive deployment of CO2 and also put CO2 into the ground. Um, I mean, drive deployment of carbon capture, I'm sorry. Um, that was the reason why EOR was looked at as one of those tax credit categories in order to drive that deployment. Um, you know, the $50 a ton was really because of uh, financially in fiscal, um, you know, trying to fiscally look at this tax credit and say, okay, really, we could have said we need a hundred dollars a ton in the early stages. It was just not politically going to be something that we could get across the finish line. So, believe it or not, fifty dollars a ton was somewhat arbitrary. Yes. Quite frankly, in looking at the original ten dollar and twenty dollar a ton values. So, a, a handful of quick things. Uh, first of all, the actual amount of balance associated with that is a function of how big you draw the systems box. And uh, the best analysis that I can refer you to is the one done by the International Energy Agency. It was published in 2017. And they looked actually at what oil is displaced globally through CO2 EOR production. Their number is that you basically get about 60% like system well-to-wheel kind of reduction. They also talked about other ways that you can do better than that, but that's sort of the, and that's the analysis I go to. Reasonable people disagree. There's also a whole school of people that say, hey, you're still creating more oil. It's still going into the air. Is that really what we want to do? It's a reasonable point of view and people can disagree around that. That takes me to the second point. This was in fact a bimodal split. And uh, uh, for Senator Whitehouse, I believe that his intent was in fact the innovation point that you talked about. That was certainly not the case for Representative Conway, where he was like, I want jobs in my district, and this will make more jobs in my district. And at the end of the day, they found a way to agree without calling it a social cost of carbon, even though it was. The last thing is I was involved in these discussions in the bill early on, and there was a whole discussion about whether to do some sort of life cycle assessment and how you do it, and the staffers at some point went, no, we're gonna keep it stupid. We're gonna keep it simple. And we're just gonna look at the tons injected we have a meter, we know how much goes down. And the rest of it's really hard to sort out, we don't care. And frankly, it's a tax credit, that's kind of okay. The whole point of these things, like it, it, if you look actually at the, the value of a wreck that is traded in a renewable market, the actual carbon abatement of that varies very widely as a function of technology, geography, markets, all these other things, the tax credit's the same. But the carbon abatement potential is quite different across the spectrum. And they said, we're not trying to optimize for tons. We want more solar in the market. Let's give them a solar tax credit. And that's like not industrial policy as well as these other kinds of policies. Before going to you, who I think is next, another Twitter question. Um, there's a question that said, is there a CCS hub or potential for one in our area? And by that, I think they mean here in the New England and, and tri-state area. And would it make sense, given the lack of either uh, and storage potential? Anybody want to field that one? I, I, all I can tell you is I am not aware of a hub, but I recall at one time that there was a hydrogen energy project that was looking to um, do offshore storage so, uh, in New Jersey. So you have the potential. 
Yeah, so I'm also not aware of a hub, but there is definitely potential here. Um, a Columbia study that I was involved in back in 2016-17 looked at um, three possible storage sites um, in the Long Island Sound and off the coast of Massachusetts um, that have really significant storage potential. They're all, um, rather than being saline storage sites, they're um, basalt storage sites, which has um, some advantage in advantages in terms of how fast the carbon dioxide mineralizes. So when you inject carbon dioxide into basalt, um, it turns to a solid. It's basically absorbed into the rock much more quickly. Um, studies have shown within two years, most of it um, becomes a solid, and so the risk of leakage is really significantly reduced. Um, but there are definitely storage sites here in New York, and there is um, definitely interest in the state in um, <coughs> developing those sites developing the support infrastructure that's needed to actually inject offshore off the coast. Mm -hmm. The only thing I'll add to that, thank you very much both of you, is that um, they, uh, there are a handful of hubs that are being proposed around the United States. One of them is to capture all the ethanol plants in the Midwest and either take them to the Illinois Basin or the Permian Basin. There's uh, several hubs that are being proposed along the Gulf Coast and there is the idea, it's not yet been sort of worked, but the idea of a hub in California uh, in particular in the Central Valley. Um, and, and these sort of small regional networks are probably how this is gonna come into being. Uh, your question, sir, and then I'll take one more Twitter question and then we'll be done for the evening. Uh, thank you very much. Um, just from a policy um, viewpoint, are there any reasonable estimates for the amount of um, lost tax revenue um, uh, from this plan? and? Are there reasonable estimates for the um, aggregate net increase in um, uh, carbon that would be captured? So the revenue estimate for the bill, I think, was um, $768 million, um, which may not seem like a lot, um, and it doesn't, but it's because the way that the um, Committee on Joint Tax um, looks at revenue scores is only over a 10-year budget window. So that's the only number that we have coming from them. I'm not aware of any other tax estimates. I don't know if anybody else on the panel has seen any of that analysis. Julio? Oh. But Judy? No, but it, I mean, it all, there's what you think will happen, which depends on how many projects we right. get. So there's some uncertainty. Um, I don't remember this offhand, but you can sort of pencil it out if you get this many projects and they each mm -hmm. store a million tons, then it would add up to that. But, but uh, Shannon's right is that the way these things get scored in Congress, there's a, mm -hmm. a score mm -hmm. and it's just based on 10 years out and it takes a lot of these projects a long time to get going. So that won't show you the full impact. Mm -hmm. um, there are tax benefits to this kind of a program, although as you may have heard that that's a controversial area to try to figure out how if you create jobs and additional economic revenue, you, you actually could increase tax revenue and that could offset what the, what the tax credit um, takes back. But, it, but that's happens with other types of tax credits and, and, often, and generally the Joint Tax Committee won't consider that. Uh, I would also sir, refer you to a recent study by the National Petroleum Council that uh, was published in just this December uh, it's easy to find, it's called the dual challenge. And uh, they make estimates as a function of how much CCS would be deployed at what price. And so if 45Q were amended to increase the price, how much would be deployed in what sectors and how much that would cost. And that was an analysis done by Jeff Brown at Stanford University among others, who was sort of the lead of that. And they make a set of discrete policy recommendations around that which are pretty explicit about the revenues associated with that and the lost revenues associated with that. We're gonna take the last question over here. Yeah. Um. So, it's coming, just a moment. I, you, were, you had your hand up a lot earlier and I'm sorry that I didn't get to you oh, sooner, okay. so. No, actually my question is a follow up on your current discussion is in this legislation was a pay as you go required so when they passed the James Adroga, they had to have a source to fund for it. Is there a source to fund this IRS? It was on an omnibus spending bill. So, um, no, all bets are off at that point. <laughs> these large packages, that's mm -hmm. the only way that we can get legislating done these days. But that is still a rule that's in place. 
because that was such a crisp answer, we have a little time for one more, and this uh, woman on the other side here has been very patient in the back. Uh, Um, I didn't realize that this would be focusing on storage, and my bag is sequestration, uh, getting the CO2 out of the atmosphere. I wonder if anybody here is familiar with Klaus Lochner. Anybody know him? Oh, He's yes. A, so yes. Klaus is a dear friend. Klaus. Oh, uh, I'm, and, I'm so and glad. The, the God, intellectual godfather, not just of direct air capture, but also That's of CO2 utilization, also of carbon mineralization, all these yes. things. And a former professor at Columbia. He was here for a long time and ran the Center for yeah. uh, uh, Earth and, was it Earth and Environmental Engineering? Right. Uh -huh. um, in addition to that, uh, another current Columbia professor, Peter Eisenberger, uh, is one of the companies, has launched one of the companies that does this. It's called Global Thermostat. He's still a professor here and teaches a class on direct air capture. Uh, and the topic of CO2 removal is one that we are very active on, not just in our center, but also with the Sabin Law Center. We're actually actively building a web portal as a resource for CO2 removal. And uh, uh, Michael Gerard is the head of that center in Romany, are involved in that. Uh, oh, so there's, there's quite a lot coming. Would like to know more about that. Um, I'd been talking about um, a, a promotion uh, to have CO2 suckers. Uh, suckers is not a good word. Mm -hmm. And we've been suckers too long for the fossil fuel industry without alternatives being we're insisting on them. And I would like to call gadgets that are built up into the air and maybe with a greenhouse underneath them so the CO2 that's removed from the air might be put to good use, maybe even saleable vegetables. But I would like to call the suckers lollipops. And if you love your kids, build them lollipops so they can have a safe future and we can have air that we can breathe. So well, that's my, my, my response to that is that sounds like our next panel uh, <laughs> and we'll have to have a, another Women in Energy event in which we bring the global set of experts on that. Um, in fact, again, this, as I said, this is an incredibly rich field. Uh, Aaron Burns at Carbon 180, Jennifer Wilcox at Worcester Polytech. There's a huge number of people who are working on this uh, and, and I look forward to hosting that. In the meantime, uh, please uh, join me in thanking our panel. Uh, this has been a Thank you again for joining us. As I mentioned, the full video recording of this will be available on our website in a few days. Our next public event, you know, get out your pencils. This is going to be good. On low carbon electricity lessons from India and China. That will be held February 25th between 6 and 7.30 in this room here at the International Affairs Building, room 1501. The panel will consist of A.J. Matur, the director of Terry in India, Deborah Seligson, an old friend, uh, an assistant professor of political science at Villanova and a longtime uh, functionary in the State Department in China. This event will be moderated by CJEP adjunct senior research scholar Philippe Benoit, who leads the Center's Energy for Development Research Initiative. Uh, and I would encourage you to go to our website and look not only for this event, but other future events. We hope to see you soon. We hope to see you again. Thank you all and enjoy your evening.